God's word, faithfully preached, is his comprehensive equipment for changing lives, delivering them from the shackles of sin, the flesh, and the world, and transforming them into useful vessels through whom Jesus can pour out his blessings. Living Seed invites you to a feast of the truth as God's servant brings to us the word of life. There are two sections that we are going to struggle to deal with, hoping God will help us. I want to deal with to whom has God committed the matter of disciple making? To whom has God committed the matter, the responsibility? Of making disciples. That's the first issue I would like us to discuss and study as the Lord will be guiding us this morning. And I want us to read a couple of verses. I remember that several of these had been said, but it was important for emphasis that we come back on it again. I would have said yes. Uh, the matter of making disciples is committed to church. That would be a very big statement. Much more now that many of us, we have actually forgotten who is the church. Every time we talk about church, church, we normally think of one organization outside there. So let the church undo it. Let's go to church. All of those things that have changed our biblical understanding of what church is. But if I will quickly say that the church is only but men and women called out from the world. Called out from sin. Who have received Christ Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And where such one or two, two or three of them are gathered. The Lord says, and what? I am in their midst. So let's first know that church is not church building. Church is people. Eh? The redeemed. Those that have been brought out of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son in the light. So instead of just talking such big words, oh, the church is supposed to make disciples. I want to be a little more deliberate by looking at to whom has been committed the burden, the privilege, the responsibility of making disciples. Matthew 28, we have been reading that over and over again. I want us to go back and read Matthew 28. All of you should get to Matthew 28. And this time, I'm going to ask you to read from verse 16 to verse 20. Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28, yes. You are reading from verse 16. 16, thank you. To, to 20. The end, yes. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee. To the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Amen. 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 Now, that's the first thing I wanted to mark. Then the eleven disciples. 
Then the eleven disciples, they went to the mountain that he has appointed them to meet with him. Are we together? And Jesus, when they saw him, they worshipped him. Quite all right, some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to the whole world. Please look at your Bible very well. Jesus spoke and started speaking to the whole world. To whom did he speak? He spoke to the 11 disciples. Spoke to them. And what did he say? All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore. And you know, the old King James is very exciting for me. How did he put it? Go ye, ye, therefore. So the Great Commission was not an unfocused commission. It wasn't given to the generality of anybody who hears it. It was properly directed and addressed to which people? Disciples. Those that have been discipled. So we want to first establish that the responsibility of making disciples is given to those who have experienced discipleship. So, I go from there. I go from there. As the Lord desires to sit over the life of each person he desires to use, he often times does it through other hands whose lives he has worked upon. He raises these men or these lives and uses them to provide those four dimensions of concentration for other lives in preparation for divine usefulness. Just as it happened to Elisha under Elijah, Timothy under Paul, God could bring his concentration on your life through another servant of his, a discipler. We have coined that word, a discipler. Or if you want to call it a disciple maker. Is that all right? Now I am wanting to keep using the word disciple, disciple maker, simply because discipleship, as I'm dealing with it, is much more holistic than coaching. You can coach a person to go and write an exam. Isn't it? You can coach a person to go and play football very well. And you can coach a person to present a sermon. Now, whereas disciple making will include coaching, it will include mentoring. It will include several things. But none of those things equates discipleship. That's why we have to continue to be careful that we don't lose the biblical concept in modern language. That's why we have to keep insisting because you know the conditions for making disciples, when we come now to look at it, you will see why discipleship has so much beyond uh, mere passing on of a skill in such a way that you can just look at me. If you know that um, I'm preaching very well in an area, I say, let me just quickly go and get that off him and go on with my life. Mm -mm. The life comes first before skills in discipleship. Life impartation. Life transfer. Life transformation. And we all with unveiled face. Beholding the glory of the Lord as in a mirror. Are being changed. 
into his image from one degree of glory to another. Hallelujah. So when it says, go and make disciples of all nations, I first want to submit to you that all the four-dimensional concentration that must be put on a life for him to be arched, for him to be transformed, for him to be conformed to the image of Christ, this four-dimensional concentration is what God is expecting that even those of us that want to make disciples must provide for those that God is bringing under our hands. I have given an illustration of Elijah, Elisha. Did you remember how Elisha came under the discipleship of Elijah? Can you remember? Do you remember at all? Do you remember that Elisha was not an idle man. Was he an idle man? He was actually an MD of Elisha and Sons Agricultural Enterprise. Development Limited. And in their company, he had 12 yokes of oxen. In those days, 12 yoke of oxen would equate tractors. So that would look like one farmer that has 12 tractors working for him on his farm. Is that a small farmer? And he had people that were manning those yokes of oxen. He himself was on number 12, which means he had employees he was an employer of labor. And he was doing well. And yet, God was asking Elijah to anoint him in his stead. And go and anoint him. You will see him on the road plowing. Go and anoint him. Elijah knew to anoint him is not what we will have done today carry a bottle of oil and just pour on his head. No. Elijah knew that to anoint a man to become a prophet in my stead, in my room, means raise him to replace you. Isn't it? So when he cast the mantle upon him, the young man knew that what I'm supposed to do is to abandon my agricultural business and do what? and follow. He went and dismantled all that he was doing. He went and scattered it. In fact, he slaughtered all the yoke of oxen, distributed the meat to all their customers to announce the dissolution of Elisha's agricultural company. And people were wondering, what has come upon your head? He said, the Lord has called me. Call you to do what? Is it to follow this kind of man? Now that's the trouble. If a lecturer were to hear the call of God here, am I, are, you, are you hearing me? As soon as he resigned, he would be looking for a puppy to preach. Am I correct? And none of us will even have boldness. To tell him, thank you for resigning your lecturer position. Now come and follow me in discipleship. He said, hey, he was a lecturer. Who resigned his job? No, he's already a lecturer. Actually, he can be lecturing in the church. No. There is no bilateral conversion. From what you are doing in the world, in the church, the truth is that the training you had to be a lecturer, as good as it is, is inadequate for you to become a maker of men for God. Are you getting what I'm talking about? The truth of the matter is that the life transfer 
that needed to take place is not the kind you had when you were studying all the philosophies you did. We are not downgrading you. You were well trained in that area, but you were deficient in carrying the life that God is talking about. So he has to resign to be what? Discipled. And as you see Elisha, as I read the word of God, I found that Elisha did not collect the double portion of the anointing of Elijah in two months. It took 14 years. If you are reading your Bible very well and you study, it took 14 solid years of doing what? Of following pouring water in the hand of Elijah. Washing his hand. Carrying his bag. Going up and down with him. Such that people that will see Elisha, do you know how they mock him? They say, your God is going to take your master from your head today. You see, as far as they were concerned, he was appearing as if he had become a boy boy. Even those that were not of any status with him when he was an MD, they were wondering, what are you doing with this man? But that is what discipleship does. And if you went back to now read your Bible very well and you look at the life of Elisha, Compare with the life of Elijah, you know that something robbed on Elijah. You know that when Elijah was this, as the Lord liveth, where did he learn that? That was the language of Elijah. Isn't it? But what was wonderful was that by the time it was time for Elijah to go, Elisha knew that what I pursued for 14 years, I cannot go back empty handed. Now, can you imagine when Paul took Timothy to follow him? How many of you know how many years following Timothy for Timothy meant? That was not a following for two months. That was not a following even for one year. Do you know that as at the time that Paul was about dying, Timothy was still a disciple. Was he still a disciple? He could still write to him and say, my son Timothy, this is the reason why I left you at Ephesus. Please come quickly to me. I'm waiting for you. But there was no doubt in our mind that Paul did not die with a body in his hand. He had laid it in the hand of who? Of Timothy. When I come to explaining that eventually, we'll do with it. But all I'm noting is that whereas God needs to sit on our lives for us to become what he wants us to be, the critical issue we have to raise this morning is that whereas many people want to be disciples under the invisible Jesus Christ, they do not understand that the Lord Jesus Christ, in order to provide his divine concentration for people to become what God wants them to be, has appointed tutors and governors to do it on his behalf. Am I communicating with you now? Are you hearing me now? Can we be disciples today? Can we? Yes. It's, 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 
it's not only possible, it's available. And it is still our discipleship under the Lord Jesus. It is still him who is discipling us to become like himself. Are you hearing me? But he has engaged men through whom his own life has become visible and said, what I did to you, do it to this man for me. Praise the Lord. So discipleship is a chain. Those that have been discipled, they have been mandated to do what? To make other disciples. And those that we are making, they have been mandated to do what? To make other disciples. So you see 2 Timothy chapter 2. Will you please help me read 2, 2, 2. 2 Timothy 2 verse 2. 2 Timothy, Timothy, yes. yes. Chapter 2. And verse 2. And verse 2. Yes, ma'am. It says, And the things you have heard me say, yes. in the presence of many witnesses, and trust to reliable people, who will also be qualified to teach others. Hmm. I was wondering... There was one word also that I've not seen there. Yes. Is that NIV? Can you repeat verse 2 for And me the again? things yes. you have heard me say yes. in the presence of many witnesses yeah. and trust to reliable people who will also Aha. be qualified to teach others. Thank you. Thank you. Did you get that now? What we are noting here is that the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses commit and trust unto faithful men and faithful women who will be able, who will be qualified to teach others also. Can you see now? What you have heard of me from among many witnesses, the same. Do what? Commit to other faithful men who will be able to do what? To teach others also. Did you see that now? The plan of God is that discipleship should be a chain. Paul will say, the things that I have received he himself is not the beginning of discipleship. Someone discipled him. Are we together? And as he was disciple, he was raised. Men like Barnabas sat on his own life. So he could sit on a Timothy, on a Titus, on an Epaphras. And he could tell Timothy, the thing that I've done to you, the thing you saw me do, Go and do the same thing and teach others and commit it to someone else who will be able to teach others also. When will discipleship finish? It will not. It was not meant to finish. It was meant to be a continuous chain. Nobody should break it. As you are being discipled, you are already responsible to do what? To disciple someone else. And the person you are discipling does not end there. You are also telling that what we are doing to you, you will do to someone else also. And that someone else also will teach others also. And those others also, also, will also teach others also, also, also. Did you understand what we are talking about? If we follow the biblical pattern, Church has a continuity plan that is not as costly. It's not actually costly. I don't know why money hijacked the work of God from our hands. I really don't know why. Because as I look at the word of God, if we follow scriptures the way it is, 
you will just discover that your church will grow. It will multiply without spending a dime. And people's need will be met. Because you see, when I go now to the practicality of discipleship, you will soon discover that when correct disciples have been raised, they don't have anything that they will not lay down for the benefit of other disciples that God is raising for them. Are we together? So there will be supplies. There will be no time that there will be nothing in the post. In fact, the Bible said, nobody lacked. When you begin to raise correct disciples, you will soon discover that supply is also a chain. It just flows. But permit me to go on. What Peter and John experienced from the Lord, they were to give to those others of the brethren. Peter traveled all the time. Did he travel alone? How did he travel? He traveled with a team of brothers whom he personally concentrated upon. Excuse me, where did he learn to travel with others? Eh? From the Lord Jesus. Because Jesus never traveled alone. Jesus will always go with a team of men and women that he wants to expose his life to. He wants them to see how he lives, how he sleeps, how he wakes up. A great while before day, he has departed to a solitary place to go and pray. How did they know? How did they know? It was because they were with him. So when Mark was writing the book of Mark, we were told actually that Mark, being very close disciple to Peter, much of what Mark was writing were the narratives that Peter was speaking and he was noting it down. Praise the Lord. So how did they know that a great while before they, Jesus had gone somewhere to go and pray? Because Peter was there. Why they were still, you know, snoring. The master has moved out of the place where they were all sleeping. And he had gone. And when people go and say, where's, where's Jesus? Where's your master? He said, ah, where is he? And then looking about, they found him where he was praying. And Peter would say, sir, all men are looking for you. In fact, they have been looking for you, sir. That's why I was looking for where you are. I didn't know that you are in this corner. Praise the Lord. So when we talk about, oh, Jesus woke up very early in the morning. Let me tell you, he did not announce it. He did not come on the general pulpit like that and say, men and brethren, I woke up 3 a.m. this morning to do my quiet time. No. No, 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 no. How did we know he woke up? Because those who were with him, they knew it and they told us. I don't know why you get what I'm talking about. That's how everything about Jesus was made known to those who were with him. So discipleship is in the context of those that he has picked to be with him. And they are the ones that he is commissioning to go and do the same thing that he did to them to do to others. So you will see Peter is traveling. He's traveling with some brothers from one place to another. Even when he went to the house of Colinius, did he go there alone? Talk to me. Did he go there alone? He went with brothers. So when the Holy Spirit fell on the Gentiles, do you remember he said, men and brethren, who shall forbid us water from baptizing these people? Let's baptize them. Was he the only one that baptized the house of Colinus? 
there were brothers that he traveled with. They were, they were moving together because he saw it in Christ Jesus. When um, Dorcas died and people were crying left and right and Peter was passing and when they, saw, they started showing him all the things that Sister Dorcas did, what did Peter do? Can any of you remember what he did? Can you remember what he did? What did he do? He sent all the people away. And he took one or two brothers to enter the room. Do you remember? And do you remember how, what he did to raise Sister Dockers? Do you remember what he said? Does he resemble exactly how Jesus raised Lazarus' daughter? Eh? Where did he learn it? It was discipleship. It was what he saw. What he has touched. What he had looked upon. That became his own life. Became his own practice. And that's what you see him. Also showing those. That he had decided to travel with. For the purpose of discipleship. Barnabas was one of them was one of his own direct disciples and he in turn concentrated on Paul for a while and then he took brother Mark you remember to also go with him until Paul was sending for Mark and said send Mark to me because he's profitable to me while he went away and took Mark and Paul took Barnabas, so you were wondering, I mean, Paul took Silas, took men like Titus. Why were they doing all of that? That was what they saw. Unfortunately, we missed that point. We missed the point. We don't understand that the way God wants his church to grow Disciples to be raised is through life concentration and life interaction. It is that some people will accept to become disciples who take people along with them as they travel in life. I pray that God will give you this understanding. I can see many of you, you pay so heavily. To rent a driver. And your driver is not your disciple. You are paying him. Drop me here. He drops you. Then he went somewhere else to do his own. When you finish, you say, yes, 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 let's go. You don't know what you are doing. Your pattern is completely different from Jesus. You are using worldly system to run the church. It can't work that way. Those brothers, hallelujah, it is among the disciples. Are we together? Those who are skilled in driving that handles their steering. So when we go somewhere, we don't have drivers. We only have disciples who drive. <laughs> are we together? And this brother who is handling the steering is doing it deliberately so as to be in the environment of discipleship. Elisha was pouring water in the hand of Elijah. Why should he be doing that? Only so as to be in the environment of Elijah. For what? For discipleship. Joshua was carrying the bag of Moses. Not because Moses cannot carry his bag. 
it was an opportunity to be where? In the environment for discipleship. Am I communicating with you now? You see, I'm telling you sincerely that your ministry is too costly. Because you are not following the master's plan. You can see so many things. But you know, as they went from place to place, can I remind you that Luke is a medical doctor. Was he a medical doctor? Yes. But he was where? In the discipleship train of Brother Paul. Eh? He was following Paul as a disciple for his life to be made. So can I have a doctor? Eh? Follow me about in discipleship? Yes. I have several of them. We are pouring in their lives. And when it is time for them to go and operate as doctors, they carry Christ's life into that place where I cannot go. My disciple that carries the same life I'm carrying, but he has a skill as a medical doctor, he goes there, he handles the place. Praise the Lord. Am I communicating with you? I'm only looking at to whom has God committed the body, the responsibility of disciple making. I said disciple making is committed to those that have experienced discipleship. Disciple making will take into cognizance all these sitting upon lives in a deliberate manner. This to me is the great commission in essence. Baptizing them into the name of the Father. One version added the word into. And it gave me a lot of sense. I know that whenever we talk of baptism, 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 all that matters to our mind is what? Water. Isn't it? We just talk of water. But when you get into Romans chapter 6 and he's dealing with baptism, he said, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Whereas water baptism is the outward ceremony of a spiritual baptism that should have taken place when we get men for God. Soaking them into Christ, into his life, into his principle. So he said, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Soaking them, embedding them, and dipping them into all the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit has soaked you into. Am I making a little sense? That the great commission, even if as soon as people came forward and they gave their life to Christ, we decided to baptize them into water as a symbol of what they have entered into. Their baptism into Christ, into his truth, into his word, continues. Oh my God. But how terrible it is that we do a ceremony of water baptism and immediately the people are released. It's only in Mark and in Luke that the Great Commission appeared, I use the word appeared because even when you study it very well, it goes beyond that. 
appear to be a mere proclamation to such a point that most of us thought now that the only thing we do in Great Commission is to do what? Is to preach. And so everybody is struggling for the pulpit. But what Jesus actually told us to do, go and do what? Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, soaking them, embedding them, Bury them into the things I have taught you. Teaching them to do what? To observe. The word observe eh? is not about mental knowledge. You teach them to do what? To to do the things that I have taught you to do. So when I look at the Great Commission, I just see that simply speaking, preaching is a little segment of it. Preaching, proclamation, is good. And of course, how can they believe if they don't hear? For faith cometh by what? By hearing. So there is an indispensable segment of the commission that has to do with proclamation, preaching. But that's just 25%. What he asks us to do to make disciples is to deliberately I know those of us that are Baptists, you know how we do our water baptism by immersion. Abby, to bury them not just into water but into Christ. Into everything that Jesus Christ represents. What do we do? Bury them. If that is the great commission that God has given to us, and Jesus was so explicit, everything. In fact, one time he said, as you see me, do to one another. Did he say something like that? So Jesus himself was the, was the curriculum which I will be introducing very quickly when we have gone through this. The responsibility of making disciples the way Jesus made them is what I'm presenting to you that that is our commission. That's our calling. And the way to do it is the way Jesus did it. Oh Lord. How did he make disciples? He said, follow me. I'm still praying that I will have brothers who look at people and say, you Follow me to Boko. I know you want to be successful in ministry, isn't it? Yes, Follow me. I will show you how to be. Follow me. And that will not be arrogance. When we use that, they say, no, 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 I don't follow any man. You are not, you're a liar. There's none of you that don't follow men. You have been following people. Even your dress, you did not originate it. You follow someone to make it. So let's stop saying, I don't follow people. You have followed men. It's only that you are following wrong men. <laughs> Many of you, you follow philosophies. That you don't even know where it came from. You are so committed to it. So you see discipleship. Is not first about following theories. This is where the critical matter of discipleship must come now. Followable man. Who says follow me. Me. 
He didn't follow my, uh, my lecture. Even though it's wonderful to follow somebody's lecture. But it's not enough. You follow a life to come to know Jesus. Hallelujah. Let us quickly establish that before I go away. So when Jesus called men, what did he say they should do? Eh? They should follow him. Follow me. And I will make him. Hallelujah. So when he told his disciples, go and make disciples of all nations, what is he actually asking those disciples also to go and say? He was also telling them to tell people, do what? Follow me. I think you helped us the other day, you quoted so many scriptures about it. Let's remind ourselves about them. Can we quickly remind ourselves about them? In Acts 16, all of you please, because this is a study, all of you should be opening your Bible so that you can be touching it and say, ah, so it's like that. That was the beginning of Paul. Acts demanding. chapter 16. Yes. From verse 1. To 3. To 3. Quickly. Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra. Where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. Uh -huh. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area. For the old knew that his father was a Greek. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Let me repeat verse 3 in the King James Version. Paul wanted to have him go on with him. Ah! Can you imagine me coming here to preach? And when I finish preaching all that I'm preaching, I sense and I feel that I will have this man. Do what? Follow me. I say, you, go come with me. Does he have a mother? What did he tell his mother? He must have said, Mom, I'm going with him. Now, you may think that is strange. How did Jesus call John and James? Let's talk, let's talk quickly, let's talk quickly. How did he call them? They were with their father, Zebedee, in the ship, mending it. They were walking. They left home that morning. To do a business. And they were doing it together. And I could imagine how John was holding one side of the net for his father. And, uh, and uh, James was putting needle and thread to tie it. Huh? And then this Jesus came. And he looked at these two boys. And he said, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. It's because sometimes when you read Bible, you try to spiritualize it. Come down, come down, come down. This thing happened by the Sea of Galilee. It didn't happen in heaven. And it didn't happen in the spirit. All of you, let's settle down, please. We are not talking of spirit. We are talking of what happened practically. So, now, look at them. They were walking with their father. He said, you, James, John, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. According to Matthew chapter 4, somebody should read it. Matthew 4. Maybe that will be verse 21 or 22. Matthew chapter 4, 
yes. verse 21. Yes. Going on from there, uh -huh. he saw two other brothers. Two other brothers. James, son of Zebedee, uh -huh. and his brother John. Yes. They were in a boat uh -huh. with their father Zebedee. Yes. Preparing their nets. Uh -huh. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Ah! Now, I'm talking to you that this is practical life. Straight away, they left the boat, they left the net, and they left their father. And they followed him. Let me ask you, how did Zebedee feel? The Bible didn't tell us. <laughs> but I can tell you, as a father, you know that. And of course, from that day forward, I don't know anything again about Zebedee. And I imagine that when he went home, his wife must have asked, where are my boys? <laughs> he said, well, I don't know. We were walking, mending the net. When this man passed, I don't know the magnet he used. <laughs> All I heard telling my sons, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. And these children... They didn't have the courtesy of telling him and say, let's discuss with our father first. They did not confer with flesh and blood. And they followed. Discipleship interrupted their lives. One of the issues why some of you will not really, really want to go Seriously with discipleship because you don't want to be interrupted. You want to be doing what you are doing until you die. That was what happened. I imagine that when they went home and uh, uh, Zebedee must have told his wife as a mother. Me, I'm just thinking normally. Don't spiritualize anything. As a mother. If your two sons did not come back home and they said they are following one man, what will you do, madam, as a mother? Please, just tell us as a mother. I will be annoyed with their father. You will be annoyed with their father, but what will you do after you finish being annoyed with their father? What will you do? You will look for them. You will go and say, what is it that my children are following? But unfortunately for Sister Mrs. Zebedee, when he got there and started hearing Jesus, what happened to her also? She became a disciple. She started following. That was how it happened. Don't be thinking in terms of uh, spirituality. I'll say, where? Eh, we don't know how God called them. That's how he called them. <laughs> Let's not. The Bible is not about talking about Absa. It's practical. That's how he called them. They followed. So their mother also started following. They were following. That's how it happened. That's how he called them. So when Timothy got, I mean, when Paul went to Lystra, and look at this young man who just attended meeting. He must have had something doing before. Am I right? Yes. And Paul desired that this one will go with him. And he said, I want you to go with me. And immediately, Timothy followed. Now, may I tell you that Timothy did not need to be circumcised to be a Christian. Am I right? Yes. But for him to have the privilege of following Paul 
in discipleship. Are you hearing me? Because there are places that Paul will like to go. When they see that he's a Greek, what would they do? They will say, no, 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 no. We don't allow Gentiles here. No, no, no. And Paul will have to be struck. And I say, boy, he's my, he's my boy. I brought him and said, we're sorry. Sorry! An uncircumcised man cannot enter here. That would have made discipleship impossible. So what did Paul do? He circumcised a grown-up man. <laughs> we used to circumcise our babies at eight days. This boy was going to be circumcised not under anesthesia. <laughs> Only so that he could be a disciple. That was how it happened. So when we want to seriously pursue the word of God in making disciples, that's how they did it. That was how it happened. There's no other way that I could read about in the Bible. And if we are talking about, yes, let's return to biblical disciple making, we have to follow Bible. So he said, follow me. And he followed. And from that moment, Timothy followed Paul. And he did seem as if he has adopted him as a son. Everywhere they went. You know they are not from the same tribe. Eh? Yes. Paul is a Jew. He is a Greek. So tribal sentiment does not come into discipleship. Because we are not trying to become a Jew or become a Greek. We are becoming like Jesus. Do you understand that? That's how he carried him. How did Barnabas, how did Barnabas, how did he get to Antioch? The Bible said, the brethren in Jerusalem said, let's send Barnabas to go and see how the brethren were when he got there. And he saw the grace of God. He decided to stay with them for one year. Then, as soon as he got there, he remembered Saul. He said, ah, there was this young man that we sent away to go to his village. So what did he do? He left and went to Tarsus looking for Saul. That's how they did discipleship. So when he got Saul, what did the Bible say he do? He brought Saul to come and do what? And be with him. May I ask you, the house they were staying, who paid the rent? You are not answering me again. It's Barnabas. What they were eating, who was bearing the cost? It was Barnabas. So you see, when you want to be a disciple maker, just as Jesus did it, the apostles followed. That's the way. So he took Paul and he was with him. For a space of one year, he was living with him. Spending time with him. Concentrating on him. Praying for him. Teaching him whatever he could teach him. <coughs> That's how he brought him up. So when they say, and he took Mark with him. You know the problem? Why brother Paul and uh, Barnabas quarreled over Mark? was that when they were going on the first missionary trip, they went and took Mark 
as part of their own understanding of discipleship. Are you understanding? They said, uh, we want you. We want Mark, follow us, follow us. And so he was following them. When they got to where the matter was too tough, John Mark said, may I go, may I go back home? <laughs> so he went back to meet his mother. That's to tell you that sometimes disciples, they can desert disciples. It's nothing strange. So when Paul returned and they have done everything, Barnabas was saying, let's take John Mark again. He said, no, no. Mm -mm. This one that didn't follow us, no, I, I don't have anything to do with him. He's too much a trant. He loves his mother too much. So can you imagine Barnabas? Barnabas must have said, yes, it's okay. It's okay. If I didn't look for you, I wonder what you will have become today. No problem. You can go with ready-made silas and all of that. And then say, John Mark, you follow me. So you can understand that discipleship, the way they practice it. Is it impossible today? Let me ask you, is it impossible today? It's not. It's not. The price they paid to follow is the same price God is asking me and you to pay. The way they raise me, if I ask this man now, Go and close what you are doing. Follow me to Boko. Is there anything wrong about that? Eh? There's nothing wrong about that. Is that bigger than what we should do? It's not. If we want to start doing the, the biblical work, the way it should be done. Then he goes, do you remember? You cannot understand Jesus met somebody. He said, follow me. Ah, the man said, excuse me. Let me go and bury my father first. Did you see that even in the days of Jesus, some people could not follow. Why? Because they love the dead. And Jesus told him, said, let the dead bury their own dead, which means the truth of the matter is that nobody actually is dead waiting for burial. <laughs> Did you hear me? Yes. It's not as if his father died and they are fixed burial for next Saturday. And Jesus was saying, no, 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 follow me, you can't bury your father. The truth is that this father he is talking about has not yet died. <laughs> Are you hearing me? Otherwise, Jesus wants to let the dead be buried in the dead. Because if, if the dead is actually dead, no dead can bury another dead. Am I right? So what Jesus was dealing with is a different issue. This man was simply saying, I will follow you, but Wait. Until my father dies, then I will be free like a bird. I will not have any other responsibility again. You know my mother is still in the village. Let me bury her first. Some of you have postponed the call of God on your life. Waiting for your mother to die. And your mother that you thought will die in five years has decided to live for 25 years. <laughs> And the last time you were the one who almost died and your mother is still kicking. Don't you understand that you are wasting your life? Don't you know that when Jesus extends a call to a man, he plans for your life. Can I inform you that the disciples that Jesus called, they were not irresponsible. Peter had a wife and Jesus said, follow me. He had a mother-in-law when he left all of that to follow. 
But when the problem came and the mother-in-law was sick, and they sent for Peter, this follow follow you, they do, your mother-in-law is sick. He's going to die any time. Do you think that was enough to break the discipleship? No. Peter simply told the Lord, Sir, I just received a phone call that my mother-in-law is sick. What shall we do? Just said, don't worry, don't worry. We'll go there. Who followed Peter? That's discipleship. Discipleship is not about church program. Discipleship involves everything. When I'm discipling this man, I follow him to his mother-in-law. We face the challenge there together. When we finish, we continue our discipleship. Some of you, your church members, you know the problem. You collect their tithe. You collect their offering every time. When their family problem arises, none of you is there. It is only their own believing relatives that are running up and down. So when they now start pouring alcoholic libation, you came and say, why did you compromise? What do you want him to do? Were you there to provide the environment for them to say, who is that man with his eye? That's my disciple. That's the man that God told me to follow so that I can learn Christ. Say, so, huh? And he's the one doing all of this. Say, yes. Because I belong to him and my problem belongs to him. What a wonderful thing it will be. So when we talk to you about discipleship, we're not talking about when you come to church. Then we stand up, we sing, we sit down, we pray, we go home. No. It's a life connection that takes you into the life of the disciple in every area. Hallelujah. That showcase to the disciple what will Christ do? If my mother died, how will a disciple bury his mother? Your disciple need to see that. Are we together? How will he talk to the village? How will he present himself to these big, big people in the village and you will not violate the word of God. How many of you desire that your pastor's mother will die so that you can see how a man of God will bury his own mother without breaking tradition and breaking the word of God? You know how great it will be if you were there to see the man handling all of it. So, hey, so that's how we can do it. It changes your perception. Am I right? Yes. But because nobody has taken you along, when your own problem comes, they say, go home. Go home. Go and say to it. And when they fix the time of barrier, a right to the church so that we can see what we can do. Mm -mm. That will not solve the problem. Praise the Lord. So, for this segment, may I say to you that discipleship is the holistic approach of all round training That God gives those that come to him. Disciple making is a process. It is not an ordinary church program. It is not just what we go to the church to do within church walls. Are we together? But what it's meant 
to be carried out even at home in every aspect of human endeavor, even in the marketplace, as well as in church. Are you getting a picture of what I'm talking about now? So when we say, go and make disciples, we are actually saying, go and take men and women, young people, old people, whichever one God gives you, and help them to see Christ in action. And take them to situations where Christ's life, hallelujah, can be made manifest. For them to see, for them to touch, for them to examine it, for them to handle it with their own hands. So, permit me to now say, discipleship is a training that God wants to give every man that comes to him in Christ Jesus until they become like Christ. I was giving a little illustration a girl who did not grow up under a mother to receive and learn motherly care and to see how a mother could balance her relationship with her husband with the care of her children. We definitely have problem in marriage. Am I right? Eh? But now this girl has repented. How many of you think that because a sister has repented, she has become a child of God? she automatically knows how to be a mother. Talk to me. You thought that because she has now become full of the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues, she's already, already automatically experienced on how to cook. Eh? Do you know the trouble is that we have so many church girls Singing. They are not marryable. <laughs> when you marry them, you have problems. <laughs> because all they know is to sing. If we have 10 visitors now and we need to make banku for them, ah, it's a problem. <laughs> Let's buy something for them. Let's buy something for them. No. You know what that sister lacks? She lacks home training. Of course, her mother, being a Stockholm believer, cannot provide that now. How does God want that sister to become a well-rounded mother tomorrow? God brought her into the new Christian life in order to provide for her in every area. So, in her says, you older women, eh? older women, Call the younger women. Teach them how to be keepers at home. Do you think we do that on the pulpit here? Let me tell you why it is not. Can I tell you why it is not? Eh? Since you came here, have you ever seen any brother quarrel with his wife while we were here? Talk to me. Eh? No, no. Is it because they don't quarry? Eh? Said the Lord is in his holy temple. Let the whole heart be quiet before him. So everybody comes. Even if there's a quarrel in the car, once they are pulling up and, and parking, say, till we get home. <laughs> All issues are suspended. To come here. I want to tell you brothers and sisters. That the church. Is the most artificial environment. I've ever known. Very artificial. Very organized. A brother. Who is actually. Dealing with his wife. Very cruel. He could come up here. And just for the time being in church, it becomes what? Gentle. Do you know there are many wives that are wishing, wishing that their husband and themselves 
They are permanently inside church program. Their wishes, I wish, I wish this is our house. Ah, and something fell down and my husband picked it for me. Ah, praise God. But when they get home, the same thing fell down. The man said, how are you carrying it? That things are falling out of your hand these days. And as things are falling out of your hand like this, these are good things will fall out of your hand. The wife said, is that how to talk to somebody? He said, who is somebody? <laughs> Look, I tell you the beat of my mind. If you are not serious, go and learn from your mother. <laughs> That's the man of God that was quiet here. Very simple, very gentle. That's why we can't do discipleship in this kind of artificiality. Discipleship requires what? A life environment. Environment of life. Where your real life comes out Without you knowing. That's where genuine discipleship takes place. When you are going. And something you didn't plan before. Just happened. And your wife said. But why did you allow this to happen? And you say. Oh I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't know it would be like that. I'm sorry please. I'm sorry. The disciple. He doesn't interrupt. It's not part of the discussion, but he's a careful observer. Does that make more sense to him than when you came to church and said, Husband, love your wives and be gentle. You know that the difference between that and this is a whole world. Because now, he's seeing how you are working out that truth that you have preached in life. Not because you are trying to impress him, but this is your life. Am I communicating? But let's imagine that we finish a service and say, wives, I mean husband, love your wife. Be gentle with them and don't be harsh. Remember that women are of a weaker vessel. Be gentle with your wives and do not be harsh. He was in the message. He took you serious. Then in the car. Something happened. And your wife say, Darling, why did you allow this? Allow what? <laughs> you think you can control me? Let it be known to you, I married you. <laughs> Let us know who is who in this house. Are you the husband? Now, the young man is there in the car. You forgot he was around. And this outburst came. What happened to all the message you have preached in his mind? What happened? Cancelled. Cancelled. He said, uh, <laughs> The way Baba lashed. Mommy, ah, <laughs> something new. So discipleship cannot take place in an artificial environment. It needs life. And this is maybe the reason why it is omitted. Can I tell you why? It is easier to preach on the pulpit than to live the life. 
Are we together? It is easier to propound a theory than to work it out. I just want to ask, would you like to be a disciple maker? The only condition is that there is need for life. That's to be life. When we res respond to this call by the grace of God, you will see miracles. You will see the kind of multiplication that we are talking about. Quality growth, quality spiritual life, and quantity. Everything comes side by side. Praise the Lord. Discipleship habitat or environment is not an empty house. A church building or a Christian camp is a good place, but it's not a sufficient environment for what? For discipleship. This is because discipleship is usually not linked from brick and mortar or from trees. It is also usually not done effectively from the pulpit. It is usually life and living situations and experiences that create the environment for discipleship. And whatever that man is doing, that life does daily at his regular work, whether he's a painter or a photographer or an architect or a preacher, only becomes the solvent or what I call the outlet for his life to be made manifest. And this is what makes proper discipleship to take place without any camouflage or covering up. A man's true color can be easily known both in his working environment and at home. Whereas he may dress up and cover up to go to church, he cannot do so for a long time at home and at work. Very soon he will relax and be himself. And that is where true discipleship can take place. Where true life is linked or passed across. How many of you lament that many children of pastors, they are very difficult and very wayward? How many of you have seen that? Can I tell you why? It's because only the pastor's child had the undiluted privilege of seeing the masquerade. He's the one that sees his father when he's bare-chested. He's the one that hears discussion that we carefully guide that no one else will hear. He's the one that sees the mood when it changes. And whereas you are preaching, he doesn't hear the message. He sees the message. And that's why whenever we want to choose any man for spiritual leadership, God said, his home is the first place to look. Unfortunately, we don't emphasize that now. We don't ask why. It's because what the children see overrides what they hear. Are we together? And so, gradually, they say, Mwah. Christianity is a drama. My father normally goes to dramatize and when he comes back, we know him. So when others are crying and say, oh, I surrender, I surrender, oh, the boy is laughing. <laughs> say, what are they surrendering? <laughs> no, be my father. We know ourselves. We need life to disciple life. We need life to raise life. So I want to draw conclusions by making the next two statements and I will stop. 
genuine discipleship must have an environment. And what is that environment, please? It's life. If I have not passed something to your mind, I want you to catch that. Discipleship needs an environment, and the environment is life. And which life? My own life. My life. My own life. My own marriage. My own life. So as to conclude it, we will soon read a passage that we read the first day when uh, the Reverend Mensah was bringing the word of God. I will want to repeat it as a concluding note for this afternoon. Discipleship may be taken as a course where there is no context of life. It will only be a theory. There is no true environment of life to impact and inculcate life into the people whom we are seeking to disciple. Discipleship cannot be tied to a place or a building or to an empty house. Spirituality is not tied to a place but to a person. And this person is the Lord Jesus. I don't know whether you noted know when Prof was saying it's not about destination. It's about connection with Jesus. Do you remember I said something like that? Yeah. Discipleship we manifest anywhere once there is a life that is pouring upon another life. So, if we want to do discipleship, Mama, you want to disciple some of your young people. As for me, as far as I'm concerned, please plant a garden. Plant a farm where you plant tomato, pepper, and lettuce, and other things. And just to create an environment for discipleship as you are working on it. Some of the young sisters, some of them are married. They busy wasting their time and troubling their husband for every Ghana CD to buy uh, tomato, to buy vegetable, to buy this. And the money is forever a problem in the house because they've never seen a virtuous woman. To learn from. A virtuous woman will wake up early in the morning. If she knows how to do crocheting, she's crocheting while we are doing other things. And what is she doing? That crocheting will soon become the pullover that she will put for her children. No need to go to supermarket and be wasting money. Right in your backyard. Fresh pepper. Fresh vegetables. So you ask them, come, 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 come. You are walking as if you are walking. You are putting something, pulling something. They are with you. You are doing discipleship. In the midst of that, a discussion is going, how is your husband? We are walking. Don't mind him. He has traveled, though. I don't know when he's coming back. Hey, don't mind him. No. Then you sat under the tree. Let's pray for your husband. Then you join hands with that young girl. And you prayed. Father, we are praying for Brother Kofi. Wherever he is, please take care of him. Remind him that he should come home today. In the name of Jesus. You finish praying. By the time this woman got home, Brother Kofi has arrived. I, I'm not expecting to say, look, as I was up there, my spirit just told me that I must come home, that you are missing me. Do you know what has happened now? This sister is now knowing that we actually can regulate husbands. 
Eh? In the place of prayer. Instead of saying, eh? Is that how to marry? You went, 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 went. You don't even remember anybody is at home for you. Where? Eh? All those people you are going, we go and meet them. Oh. You use your mouth to scatter your marriage. Because you've not been discipled. So genuine discipleship doesn't take place here. It takes place in the farm as we are weeding. As we are weeding. Discussion is going on. Bible is being read because it has been internalized. Are we together? And as we are doing that, we are praying. We stop. Five minute prayer is enough to do a big miracle. That's discipleship. Life connection. So it's not because you could not get money to buy all the vegetables, but you need your garden as the garden for discipling young people. Are we together? And as they come, ah, mom, where did you get this leaves? Yeah, look, this leaf, if you cut it like this, is moringa. Go and plant it in your compound. And this is how we dry it. Next time when you make your soup, put it. There's nothing like it. And when she's going home, you give him a small, in a small chart sachet. She goes home, tries it. It worked. What have you taught him now? You have taught him how to give. All the big, big men say, give and it shall be given unto you. It doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. Where is the environment to see it? May the Lord help you to respond to the call of God today. Environment for discipleship to take place is life. Permit me to say that it is not even mere Bible teaching. You must be in your disciples live environment for proper discipleship to take place. Suppose as a disciple, you are with your disciple at home and suddenly one morning, you hear his wife weeping in the bedroom and saying, if you want to kill me, kill me today. As you go near the door, you find it locked. You know that a fight is going on. If that happens, can that disciple make more impact on your life? It's difficult. So discipleship will keep the disciple holy. It will keep the disciple straight. Am I right? But because we are doing this artificial Christianity, many of us could hide our lives because we are not mirroring it to anybody. So we could get rotten inside. But who am I to misbehave when I know I have disciples who are following me? They see how I eat. When I go to preach, because I don't go alone, I have disciples. They are watching me. They say, now they have brought this big plate of meat. Let's see how the man of God will finish it. <laughs> it is there you show your greed. Nobody knows you're a greedy man here. It is when they brought food. Eh? And that special part of chicken, the gizzard, if they did not put it there, your eyes turn red. <laughs> Where the gizzard? <sighs> that's where we know who you are. And that's where discipleship takes place. Will you please pray? Lord, if it is not angels that will come and disciple men on earth, it is men that you have touched that will touch other men. Father, touch me and use me to touch others. Make me and use me, O oh God, to facilitate the making of others. Father, I have seen the omission of discipleship in my own life. But today, Lord, I'm asking, make me 
that I may go in my own lifetime to make lives for you. Give me opportunity of touching other lives in a way that they also can be raised to become disciple makers. Please pray about that. How I wish to say to God, Lord, make my life an environment for impacting others. Make my home a discipleship center where other women, other men can be fashioned for your glory. Deliver me from being a talkative who only talks. Make my life a practical demonstration of Christ's life. Please, Lord. Lord, make me. Make me the man you want me to be. Thank you. Will you please in mercy write this in our hearts. Write this in our spirit. Let this conference produce disciple makers. Let it change the story. Cause us to see transformation in our churches from this meeting. Thank you. In Jesus Christ's name we have prayed. Amen. This has been Living Seed. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House. P.O. Box 971 Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703 036359, 0703 768119. Email address lsmedia at livingseed.org or visit our website at www.livingseed.org. Make it a date with us next week.